This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. We begin today's show in Gaza, where the death toll from Israel's 90-day bombardment has topped 22,600, with another 7,000 people reported missing and presumed dead. Health officials in Gaza say Israel killed at least 162 Palestinians over the last 24 hours as the IDF intensifies its attacks on refugee camps in central and south Gaza, areas deemed by Israel to be safe zones. Doctors in Gaza describe horrific conditions inside the few hospitals still open. In a minute, we'll be joined by a Palestinian man who just arrived in Britain after fleeing Gaza. Mohamed Galiani is an air quality scientist who spent nearly three months in Gaza, where he had been visiting family. He just returned to Manchester, England, Wednesday, where he has dual citizenship. This is Galiani speaking at the airport after his arrival in Britain. After spending six, five days under Israel's brutal bombing, I made what was, to me, an impossible choice. It's one that I've been fearing since the beginning of the attack, and that was to use the privilege of my British passport to leave Gaza. Um, it's a choice not available to the, the majority of Palestinians in Gaza, uh, people who are currently suffering from malnutrition, severe dehydration, and an overwhelming public health crisis. As Israel relentlessly and openly pursues the campaign to force all the people out of Gaza, be it by death or forced relocation to Egypt. I actually fear that I may never, we may never see our home again. Mohamed Galayini speaking after landing in Manchester Wednesday, joining us now from Manchester, also the co-founder of Amplify Gaza Stories, which works to share voices from Gaza. Mohamed Galayini, you were in Gaza with your family. You fled first to Egypt on December 10th, and now you're home in Manchester. Can you lay out what you saw? Can you talk about Israel's bombardment of Gaza? Hi, Amy. Thank you for having me on. Um, uh, goodness, that's quite a quite a quite a, uh, a, a, a difficult uh, question to answer comprehensively, but I'll I'll try. Um, uh, I guess. Um, sorry, I just need to take a moment. It's it's it's. Um, it was really um, hard to imagine things getting any worse on any particular day but they they did keep getting worse i think that's probably like one way one way to to look at it um can you, you know, start we, off we, by telling us where you were we'll just go through some of the facts yeah, you've gone to gaza to see your family when did you go i uh, traveled to gaza on the 18th of september uh for a extended visit uh both to see my family but also to look at moving back there for work. Um, I've been out of Gaza for almost 20 years now. Um, and, um, you know, the trip was going as, I guess, as planned. On the on the morning of uh, the 7th of October, I had got up quite early to go harvest olives with my cousins. Um, and as I, as I woke up, I saw rocket trails uh, that gave me the, the first tip off that something was, was off. Um, as... I guess as the rocket um, fire lasted into more than an hour, it really started becoming apparent how significant the day was. Uh, then there was a, a bombing, an Israeli aerial bombardment, uh, 50 meters from our apartment that shattered all the glass um, there. And we, um, we at that point, I started taking the decision to leave the apartment because it's actually quite close to the beach, so not a great place to be. And then, then began a succession of uh, of displacements. Uh, first to the, to an apartment about a kilometer away, then to my father's home and IVF center, then to a hotel in North Gaza that was supposedly a safe haven because of its, you know, shelters journalists and aid workers. I've I've since learned that that's been destroyed, as has my father's uh, IVF and uh, ho center and home. Um, on the 13th of October, we, you know, with bombing happening all around us, um, you know, we saw tower blocks that 
uh, housed thousands of people being bombarded for 36 hours. And then eventually um, they were like, brought down um, after this wanton bombardment. Uh, it, it, there was, I mean, destruction everywhere that you looked, uh, wherever you went. And um, yeah, we, on the 13th of October, Israel issued a, an order to the population of, of Gaza, an illegal order, I might add, telling people to leave, to go south of, of Wadi Gaza, the Gaza River. And, um, you know, it set a lot of people into a panic. And anyone that had an ability to leave, uh, a lot of people left. And we were, among them, it was it was um, a, a very very difficult choice then, because um, you know because it's like an impossible choice or a false choice between I guess your your safety and your home, and then you know if if you consider the headlines that you you were um, you were uh, you know the headline about the bombardment in areas of of Khan Yunus in the south that were deemed as in quote safe zones. Uh, we found out, as did hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, that nowhere was actually safe in Gaza. And um, I think that's all part of this strategy of uh, terrorizing Palestinians, uh, sowing deliberate confusion until people, like, at the end of their tether, because they have no access to water, uh, scarce food, um, and no access to health care. And, 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 you know, people are like, eventually are going to be asking themselves, well, well where, should we, where should we go? And, and you know, I, I truly am of the belief, and I think there is, like, evidence to suggest that Israel is trying to push Palestinians into the Sinai. They'll deny it, and their supporters will deny it. But I, ultimately, um, Israel is a master of uh, creating facts on the ground uh, and plausible deniability, I guess. Um, I can carry on if you want, like recounting well, our journey. Let me ask or... you something. You're an air quality scientist. Can you talk about the air quality in Gaza with this massive level of bombardment? Um, excuse me. So, so I've got a cough now, and uh, I think throughout my time in Gaza, I had a cough, and I think the coughs are quite common right now and and part of that is because of the number of respiratory irritants that are in the in the air because of the bombardment so starting with the rubble from buildings that when it's bombed are pulverized into fine particles that uh, that every time there's a gust of wind spread in the air and create an elevated level of uh, particulate matter but then but it doesn't stop at rubble from buildings and other explosive residue and and what have you because because you also have um because of the lack of of power uh right now people are relying on alternative fuels to both so for example solid fuel for for cooking is so common so you you walk down any street and it's thick with smoke from from countless fires that are being lit just to substitute for gas and then add to that because of the lack of uh, transport fuel, people are fueling their cars with um, with cooking oil that, again, is not a good substitute for diesel because it has like a higher, uh, a worse emission profile that, again, causes, uh, un, you know, untold um, public health uh, harms, and um, and I think you know th those are the. The, the key the key the key air quality Mohammed, uh, you, issues right now can you talk yeah. about the israeli so called fire belts the name of the rapid succession strikes that destroy whole gaza city blocks yeah it's it's really something horrific to be, to behold because you, you know you 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 just you hear the whoosh of a jet and then you hear the the uh, you know the explosion that results from say a one ton bomb that's laid down and then you think okay is that it and then and then you hear 10, 10 more in quick succession that just like surround or saturate a neighborhood with bombardment and people you know people have nowhere to go so you know so for example the the i i as i was saying we were in this in this location in north gaza next to, to the mukhabarat towers in north gaza by the by the beach and these to towers were subject to an almost 24 hour successive fire fire belts uh, some people came came to us uh, they came to seek shelter where we were and they said 
you know, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't leave. We were, we were pinned down by bombing all around us. Um, and, you know, it's this massive, uh, indiscriminate use of explosive power in densely populated areas without any regard for civilian lives uh, in, those, in those areas. And it's, um, you know, it's very, it's very cynical because, um, you know, they, I mean, I think initially uh, an Israeli military spokesperson says we are, we are seeking uh, damage, not accuracy uh, in, in, in their bombing. But then, they, but then at the same time, they, they keep saying we're, our strikes are very targeted and, uh, and um, our strikes um, only focus on terrorist infrastructure or whatever, whatever like, you know, that, that kind of tired terminology of, of terrorism that they, that they use. And, and then, and then later on, we find out that more than fifty percent of the munitions dropped on Gaza were not smart targeted bombs, but rather just yeah. So, so um, it's really hard. I mean, being in it, but also just being around it and hearing, no, knowing that every explosion is another family being killed and displaced and losing their home. Uh, Mohammed, it's, it's really, really... on an Instagram post in early November, you said, really sad to hear that my dear cousin Leila al-Haddad's uncle's family have been killed by the Israeli bombing of their home in Gaza City. Um, I didn't know them, but feel your pain, Leila, you write. You said you acknowledged their murder on an interview with BBC Five Live just now, and the presenter tried to mince words that they needed to verify. Your response? Um, again, the ultimate slight or cynical denial of the suffering of Palestinians. You know, on the one on the one hand, we are expected to mourn and um, kind of acknowledge the death of Israelis, and we, and, and, you know, and, and as humanitarians, we do. Um, and ex expected to accept the Israeli government's uh, narrative of that. But on the other hand, Palestinian suffering and Palestinian deaths that are much more documented uh, are each one is dissected and analyzed ad infinitum to deny, deny this, de deny the, 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 the genocide that is going on and I, I i will call it a, a genocide i mean i uh, it's very it's, it's just it, it's the ultimate in dehumani dehumanization i'm sorry um every every time i report uh someone that i know or someone or a relative that's been that's been killed by israel i'll be asked but but do you have do you have proof that it was israel do you have do you, you know we, we can't we can't verify that surely so so that so we can't mention this it's 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 oh uh, hor horrible. Eighty um, members of your extended family have died in Gaza. Yes. So, uh, fifteen of my mother's cousins were were killed in their home in Khan Yunis uh, in early October. Later in October, another ten of my mother's cousins, uh, tw twenty of my father's cousins, and 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 and, and others that I've I've almost like lost lost track or lost count um and it's just we, we i mean my my coping strategy is is to is in some way to to try and, and not know but obviously you you know you can't avoid it um i think one of the most um horrific incidents that really really stood with with us though was um in late december well on the 19th of december we got the news that uh, six of my cousins, along with their in-laws from the Anan family, so Ghalayini family and the Anan family, uh, who were sheltering in in the, the home of the Anan family in in Gaza City, they'd been surrounded by the IDF for um for for a couple of days, and then the Israeli army went into the house. Um, they separated the men from the women. So, like in in, in that process in itself, in being able to separate men from women, it is telling. It's telling in terms of the level of threat or lack thereof. And then 15 of the men in the home were shot by the Israeli army. And then they also threw explosives into the rooms that the women were sheltering in. Many of them were, were injured as well. Uh, this has been 
uh, documented or by the Euromed Human Rights Monitor. It's also been uh, a press statement was issued by the UN Office for Coordination of, Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And the Israeli army has, has form when it comes to summary execu executions. They, they executed their hostages as they were walking towards them bare-chested, waving, waving white flags and and I, you know, I'm I'm fearful for for everyone I know that's in Gaza from from either an, a meeting an explosive death or a death by by trigger happy genocidal soldiers who are like drunk, obviously, on the power that they are wielding and. Mohammed, kind of, I wanted to get your response to yeah. Israel's ambassador to the United Kingdom, where you have dual citizenship, Sipi mm -hmm. Hotaveli, um, who has openly embraced destroying the whole of Gaza. She made the comment during an interview on the London radio station LBC. One of the things we realize is that every school, every mosque, every second house has an access to tunnel. So this is, and, and of course, immunity. That's an argument for so, destroying the whole of Gaza, every single building in it. So do you have another solution how to destroy the underground tunnel city, that this is the place where the terrorists hide? So that's the Israeli ambassador to the UK. Um, can you first respond to Sipi Hotaveli? Of course. Sophia Hotzbelli needs to be expelled from the United Kingdom. She is a purveyor of fake news that is a way of manufacturing consent for Israel's genocidal actions. And it, the UK government needs to expel her as a diplomat. She is, she is a propagandist, not a diplomat. And, um, you know, she... she is someone that is is you know provide, making making the case for Israel to continue with it, with this impunity in its in its war crimes and it's all all fake news uh, with no no proof but like in the end if you have a position of power and access to the, to the media then you 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 it doesn't you are, you're often unchecked and unquestioned and unfortunately. Um, not all media. I mean, I'm glad the presenter challenged her, but I don't think I don't know how how far the challenge went in that piece. And ultimately, um, ultimately, there's a lot of bad bad journalism going on. And I guess this is like one of the reasons why this is so important to have like independent media like Democracy Now, and also like independent um, uh, voices on social media um, of making sure that. The checks and balances when it comes to uh, political statements and propaganda are are in place. Mohammed, I want to ask you a last question. If you could talk about your decision when you left Gaza, you stayed in Cairo to try to readjust, uh, almost afraid to come home to Manchester. Can you talk about that transition? What you face now? What you're calling for? I mean, so um, my my heart is still in Gaza. I I did not want to leave Gaza because I knew when I was in Gaza, I knew that I could. I was there. I was present in the moment, and the only the only um, struggle that I was facing was that of surviving and telling our story. And now, I guess, outside Gaza, it's it's a much in some ways, it's, it's, it's obviously I, I'm glad to be physically safe. It's a, it's, but at the same time, I have like a very, very heavy weight of responsibility to keep honouring and amplifying the voices of like my my country people in Gaza, and and making sure that um, we keep up the political pressure uh, to to make sure that you know that first of all there's a ceasefire. And that Israel, Israel and its allies are held accountable. And so I'm so glad that South Africa has brought this case at the International Court for Justice. And, you know, I think this would not have been possible without the voices of, of millions of supporters of Palestine protesting and protesting in very, very difficult conditions, like a political, a political climate that 
is so hostile that accuses you of anti-Semitism, even though it's the last thing that people are are doing by criticizing Israel. And and um, and, and and I think it's so important to keep up that pressure and pressure. And I'm adding my my voice to that. And if I can, if I may, maybe just for a moment speak of Amplify Gaza stories, um, an initiative that I set up with with uh, cam- friends and campaigners in, in Manchester where, you know, we, we like ultimately wanted to, we know, obviously, you know that there's a, a narrative that's predominant in terms of uh, putting the Israeli narrative in front of the Palestinian narrative. And we felt, you know, there was always space for getting more Palestinian voices out there. And, uh, you know, so we did this by, I, I, I took testimony, I interviewed, interviewed people in Gaza and we translated it and got it either published on social media or on, or on, in, in, in pushed it to, to other platforms. And it's something that we're continuing along with a, like a network of, of contacts in Gaza to make sure that um, the Palestinian voices are, are heard. And, and, and it's a two way thing as well, because we're also working on practical solidarity. Um, so for example, we have a, a, at the moment, we're raising money on a crowdfunder to support families uh, cooking uh, hot meals for their for their for their immediate community. So it's kind of about about ensuring that they have the means for resilience. Because I think right now, one part of Israel's strategy is is battering down the, the resilience of Palestinians, so that people are so battered and and broken that they can't like resist through their existence, and and that's what we're trying to do to help them. There's so that. much more to talk about, Mohammed, but we have to end here. Mohammed Galayini is a British-Palestinian air quality scientist, spent nearly three months in Gaza, has just recently returned to Manchester, England. He returned on Wednesday, co-founder of Amplify Gaza Stories. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org give.